Welcome! This is a basic introduction to modeling with the Low Impact Development Treatment Train Tool, or the LIDTTT. This tool analyzes stormwater runoff volumes and pollutant load removal using low impact development techniques. For more information on LIDs, please visit the LID Stormwater Management Planning and Design Guide. In this tutorial, we will cover how to build a model from scratch, how to add and size LIDs, and compare pre to post development scenarios. To begin, let's create a new LID TTT project. In the Scenario Configuration screen, you will have to add Project Details, Scenario Details, and Storm Conditions. Let's start off by naming the project. Under Scenario Type, you have the option of selecting Pre-Development, Post-Development, or Other. In this example, the first scenario I'm going to model is a pre-development scenario, as if the site is a natural landscape prior to any impervious or built infrastructure. Later in this tutorial, we're going to model our post-development scenario, which will include buildings and parking lots as well as our LIDs. When we compare the pre to post, we can see how well our LIDs perform in mimicking the pre-development water balance. Next, I'll select my location. For storm type, I'm going to select a single storm event. You also have the options for average annual and continuous modeling. I will specify the total rainfall depth and the duration of the storm. Next, I'll choose the design storm distribution. The SES and Chicago are generally the two most common rainfall intensity distribution methods, from which I'll choose the SES. You have the option to set a value for your target runoff depth. This model runs a logical test at the end of a simulation to check whether your site meets this runoff target. The tool already has default precipitation and temperature time series loaded for the different storm types and distributions. However, you have the option of uploading your custom time series. For this example, I'm going to use the one already in the program. If we had some background layers such as an image, we could open it here for reference. Instead, I'm going to use the built-in Google Maps service in the tool. Once you click Continue, you will be prompted to save your file. Now I'm going to locate my site. Click the address search icon on the bottom left and type your street address as well as the, as well as the city or province. In this example, my site consists of the Newmarket Plaza, Henry's parking lot, Henry's roof, and the adjacent park next to it. These will be my four main subcatchments. The first thing I'm going to do is place the outfalls. Select the outfall icon from the feature menu and click once to place it. Fill out the name in the parameter input box. The first outfall will collect runoff from Henry's roof, Henry's parking lot, as well as the adjacent park. These three features will make up catchment one. I will leave the outfall inward elevation at sea level, or 0 meters. The second outfall will collect runoff only from the New Market Plaza. The New Market Plaza will be part of catchment 2. This outfall will also be left with its inward elevation at sea level. Next, I'm going to create my subcatchments. The first subcatchment I'm going to model is Henry's roof. Select the subcatchment icon from the feature menu and trace out the shape by clicking on each corner. Double click to complete the shape. You can always go back to edit your shape by double clicking on the vertices. Fill out the required information in the edit panel. Let's start out by giving it a name. Specify the soil type as clay loam. Confirm the subcatchment resides in catchment 1. 
The area of the subcashment has already been estimated using the auto length feature on the map. You can adjust this area based on your need. I'm going to leave it as it is. Because this is a pre-development scenario, we're going to model the subcashment as a natural feature. So for land use, I will assign it 100% area coverage of open space and parkland. Route the subcashment to the appropriate outlet. I will set the subcashment width to 50 meters. If you hover over the question mark icon, it provides more information on the parameters and sometimes recommended values. I'm going to leave the rest of the defaults as is. If this were a real model, I would have to set up other attributes as well. I will now repeat these steps for the remaining three subcatchments. Note for the plaza roof, the catchment should be 2 and the outfall selector should be the second outfall. The final drawing looks something like this. Click on the report to run the model. In this example, we are simulating a 27mm event over 4 hours and aiming to control 25mm of that volume. In the report page, you can expand each of these headings to view the results. You can also export the results as a PDF file. To familiarize ourselves with the result, let's answer the following questions. What is the rainfall volume control provided in cubic meters? This value is listed under the, under the design storm performance goal. The total rainfall volume control provided is 635 cubic meters. What is the rainfall reduction in millimeters and percentage? This value is listed under the water balance summary. The total rainfall reduction is 26.28 millimeters or 97%. What is the maximum flow at node out to in cubic me meters per second? This value is listed under the peak flow. The max flow at node out to is 0.001 cubic meters per second. To return back to the drawing screen, click on the GIS button. Click on the epsilon or the three dots on the menu bar below the title and click save. This concludes our pre-development scenario. Our post-development scenario will consist of impervious surfaces and infrastructures and any additional LIDs we want to add. We do not have to redraw all of our subcashments again. We can simply reconfigure our pre-development model we just created as a starting point for the post-development. Select Click to add a scenario and click Open Scenario. In the file dialog box, navigate to the pre-development.json file, create a copy and rename the new file. Right now, I have two identical models open side by side. I'm going to use the one on the right as my post-development scenario. Click on the ellipsis and select Config. Edit only the project names and scenario type. Everything else can remain the same. Notice the model names now reflect the scenario types. Modeling a post-development scenario is an iterative process. The general premise is to first run the model with only the impervious surfaces and infrastructures and check whether or not they meet the runoff volume control targets. If it doesn't, go back to the drawing board, place and size the LIDs, run and check again. Continue adding or resizing the LIDs until the volume control target is met. Let's start with specifying the impervious surfaces and infrastructures present on the site. Starting with Henry's parking lot, specify 100% paved surface and 0% open space or parkland. Next, for Henry's roof, specify 100% roof surface and 0% open space and parkland. 
Similarly, for the landscape region, specify 100% landscape region and 0% open space and parkland. And last but not least, for the plaza roof, specify 100% roof, surface, and 0% open space and parkland. You can run the model by clicking the report button, which will only run the model for the active scenario. If you click the double arrow button, it will run both scenarios simultaneously and display the results side by side for easy comparison. Let's run the model by clicking the double arrow button. Under the design storm performance goal, we see that the rainfall control provided is 147 cubic meters compared to the 637 cubic meters for the rainfall volume control provided in the pre-development scenario. Similarly, under the water balance comparison, we see that the rainfall reduction in the post-development scenario is only 21%, compared to the rainfall reduction of 97% in the pre-development scenario. Under loading TSS, we have more details on the loading and volume information for each catchment. For instance, the total incoming and outgoing flow from Henry's parking is 88 and 80 cubic meters respectively, whereas the flow from the landscape region is 112 to 10 cubic meters respectively, a big difference between the two land types. It is apparent we do not meet the runoff volume control target and it is an incentive to use LIDs. Back to the drawing map, we are going to place a bioretention LID. This will control the runoff from Henry's property, both the parking lot and the roof. Because the bioretention is a landscaped LID, I'm going to place it on the grass landscape region adjacent to Henry's property. Important to note in the LID TTT, subcatchments cannot overlap each other, or we end up double counting the runoff. If we're going to add a bioretention here, we need to adjust the shape of the underlying landscape. Double click on the landscape region and make some room for the bioretention. Click the compass icon and draw the bioretention LID. Let's give it a name. Assign the LID type. Make sure it's part of catchment one. And assign an outlet. I'm gonna change the subcatchment width to 10 meters and provide a landscaped area of 100%. Next, I'm going to adjust the berm height to 300 millimeters. Give it a soil conductivity rate of 80 millimeters per hour. A storage thickness of 500 millimeters. And assign it an under drain with an offset height of 450 millimeters. Once I have drawn a receiving LID feature, I can go back to specify the outlet for Henry's roof and parking subcatchment to be the bioretention I just created. Let's run the scenario and see how well the LID performs. Under LID Summary, we see we are achieving a runoff reduction of 53%. And secondly, the effective impervious to pervious ratio with a value of 18.6 is highlighted in red. This number provides guidance on the maximum drainage area to an LID feature. The help guide can provide more information on this parameter. Navigate to the help guide from the menu bar and locate the effective impervious to pervious ratio from the table of contents. The maximum IP to P ratio listed for a bioretention is 15 to 1. That means we must increase the bioretention or decrease the drainage area to meet the 15 to 1 requirement. I'll go with the former. Let's try doubling the bioretention.
Let's review the LID summary now. The flow out of the bioretention is 0 cubic meters, the flow reduction is 100%, and the effective impervious to pervious ratio is 9.2, no longer highlighted in red as it is below the 15 to 1 threshold. Keep in mind that IP ratio is just one design parameter that should be considered when sizing an LID feature. You should now check other aspects of your model, such as runoff volume control and drawdown time. You can use the comparison report to check other results, such as the water balance summary, the total suspended solids, and the total loading summary, and peak flow results as well. Since we still haven't met our runoff volume control target, try adding more LIDs to control the runoff from the New Market Plaza. This concludes the introduction to the LID TTT tutorial, where we covered setting up a model from scratch, adding and sizing your LIDs, and comparing pre- to post-development scenarios to further help meet your runoff volume and pollutant removal targets.